Let's turn now to Acts chapter 18. After these things, after Paul had been in Athens, stirred when he saw the idolatry, after Paul had ministered to the Epicurean and uh, the uh, Stoics there on Mars Hill, now Paul leaves Athens and he travels down to Corinth. Now when Paul had arrived in Athens, he told those that accompanied with him to tell Silas and Timothy to come to him with all haste. Get here speedily. But before Silas and Timothy can get there, for reasons not explained, Paul left Athens and headed towards Corinth. So Paul's stay in Athens, no doubt, had to be a very short stay uh, because he is now on his way to Corinth. Corinth could be thought of as the evil capital in that day. It was like Hollywood, Las Vegas, and San Francisco combined. <laughs> Almost every wicked vice was practiced in that city. Corinth was on a very narrow isthmus that almost divides Greece. The Ionian and the Aegean Sea almost come together there at Corinth. It's probably only between two and a half to four miles across from the Aegean to the Ionian Sea there at Corinth. In later years, those builders of the Suez Canal went to Corinth and they did make a canal that uh, the ships are able now, smaller ships, to pass through the canal. And it saves a long, treacherous journey around the Cape uh, known as Malia. But of course, in the ancient days, because sailing around Malia was so dangerous. Usually ships that were coming with goods from Ephesus and from the east would come to the port side of Corinth, and there were the two ports, both on the Aegean side and on the uh, Iconian side. They would come to the port on the Aegean side where they would uh, let their cargo off, the cargo then would be carried over the narrow isthmus and uh, loaded on ships on the other side uh, to take it on to Rome, Puteoli, the port of Rome. And so uh, it was a city uh, that was a major intersection commercially between the east and the west because most of the goods would be transported across. And of course, you have all of uh, the maritime people there, the sailors, and looking for a good time in, you know, in Corinth. And it was, a, it was a center for drunkenness. It was a center for prostitution. And as I said, every evil vice you can think of. But not only that, uh, if you were going from the north in Greece to the south of Greece, you would have to pass through Corinth. Uh, because the city of Corinth actually occupied that whole uh, area there because it was just such a short distance, uh, you would have to pass through Corinth. And so it was a major uh, kind of a uh, highway, you might say, uh, from Greece to the area of Achaia, and uh, it also uh, the major seaport. And it became the hub and the commerce center. And whenever they would portray 
in their plays, the Greeks were great for their dramas and all, whenever they would portray a Corinthian in the Greek drama, they would always portray him as being drunk. The proverb, he lives like a Corinthian, was a proverb that expressed a person who lived a licentious, debauched life. Above the city of Corinth, a steep cliff, 2,000 feet to the Acropolis on the top. On the Acropolis, there was the great temple to Aphrodite, uh, the female goddess of fertility. There were a thousand priestesses. They called them vestal virgins, but they were anything but virgins. Uh, they were actually prostitutes. And they would come down into the city of Corinth at night where they would ply their trade. And uh, thus was the temple of Aphrodite supported uh, by the thousand priestesses who uh, were, as I said, prostitutes. So Corinth was one of those anything-goes cities. And into this totally hedonistic and heathenistic culture came the Apostle Paul with the gospel of Jesus Christ. When Paul wrote to the Corinthians in his first letter, he said, Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor male prostitutes, nor homosexuals, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor uh, revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you. Paul is naming off the things that were common in Corinth. And writing to the Corinthians, he said, some of you were among this type of a crowd, but you've been washed, you're sanctified, you are justified in the name of our Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. And then he said, don't you know that your bodies are the members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them members with a prostitute? God forbid. What? Know ye not that they which are joined to a prostitute are one body? For the Lord said, The two, saith he, shall become one flesh. Shall I then make Christ join with the prostitute? And because prostitution was such a common thing, Paul speaks against it in his letter to the Corinthians because uh, coming out of that pagan culture, uh, coming out of that uh, loose living, it was sometimes hard for the believers to make a full and complete break with the things of the world. And so uh, Paul addresses that as he writes his letter to the Corinthians on a later date. Now we read that when he came to Corinth, he found a certain Jew named Aquila who was born in Pontus. Now Pontus was up in the area near the Black Sea. And... Uh, you remember on the day of Pentecost, uh, those that were there to observe uh, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, there were those there that were from Pontus. And so evidently there was a uh, large Jewish uh, sector there in Pontus. Uh, but he, with his wife Priscilla, had recently come from Italy because the emperor Claudius had expelled all of the Jews from Rome. Now, 
It was in the year 49 AD that Claudius expelled all of the Jews from Rome. And so we can actually uh, place Paul in Corinth somewhere around 50 to 54 uh, AD is when Paul came to this wicked city of Corinth. Aquila and Priscilla are an interesting couple. They were tent makers by trade, and it would appear that they hired Paul to work for them because Paul also was a tent maker by trade. Now, the rabbis did not receive a salary for their work in the ministry. So each rabbi needed a trade by which he could support himself. And the Jews placed a great stress on seeing that their children had a trade that they could always fall back on. In fact, they used to say that if you did not teach your child a trade or your son a trade, you were preparing him to be a thief. Uh, they saw it necessary that everybody learn a trade. You never know when you might have to fall back upon the trade. It seems that uh, there came a very close bonding between uh, Aquila and his wife Priscilla along with Paul. Uh, when Paul, after a year and a half, left Corinth, on his way back to Jerusalem to attend the feast, Priscilla and Aquila went with Paul as far as Ephesus. And they stayed there in Ephesus as Paul went on to Jerusalem to observe the feast. And so at the uh, end of the chapter here, uh, in verse 24, we read that when a certain Jew named Apollos who was born in Alexandria, who was an eloquent man, mighty in the scriptures, when he came to Ephesus. This man was instructed in the way of the Lord, and being fervent in the spirit, he spoke and he taught diligently the things of the Lord, but he only knew the baptism of John. And he began to speak boldly in the synagogue, uh, whom when Aquila and Priscilla had heard him, they took him unto them, and they expounded unto him the way of God more perfectly. So they were there in Ephesus, and they actually started a church in their home there in Ephesus. And here came this Jew, Apollos, from Alexandria, a very eloquent man, and very knowledgeable in the scriptures, and uh, as he was preaching the baptism of John, they took him aside and they explained more fully to him the gospel. And so uh, we do find that uh, when Paul wrote his first letter to the Corinthians from Ephesus in about 59, he told them that Priscilla and Aquila send their greetings along with the church that was in their house. Paul was in Ephesus when he wrote the letter to the Corinthians. And so uh, he said, Priscilla and Aquila, they send their greetings to you along with all of those that are in the church in their house. A year later, when Paul wrote to the church in Rome, he told them to greet Priscilla and Aquila who were his helpers in Christ Jesus. So these people, probably quite wealthy, uh, they sort of traveled around. Uh, they, they had their trade and uh, they were business people and they could pretty much go wherever they wanted. And so uh, they were in Corinth when Paul first met them. Uh, they went with Paul to Ephesus where they stayed for a few years. Uh, but then they went on back to Rome. Of course, they had started out in Rome, was, were expelled uh, in 49 when Claudius expelled the Jews. But they went back to Rome. 
and uh, are among the believers in Rome in the year 60. But about five years later, when Paul wrote his second letter to Timothy, who was at that time pastoring in Ephesus, he asked Timothy to greet Prisca and Aquila, who were his helpers in Christ Jesus. So uh, he twice calls them his helpers in Christ Jesus, and now they're back in Ephesus. So they're uh, just sort of... uh, Love to move around, but the thing is, wherever they were, they were engaged in the gospel work. Now, they were tent makers. They, they weren't, you know, they, they weren't ordained or, or things of that nature, but yet serving the Lord. And I think that it's important for us to realize that God has called all of us to serve him but not all in the same capacity. Uh, The church is likened to a body. And the body has many parts. Uh, The the body would be rather peculiar if it were all just an eye. (laughs) Like some of the cartoons almost that you see nowadays. Uh, grotesque things, you know, where the whole thing is an eye. (laughs) Kids play with those things. (laughs) But when Paul wrote to the Ephesians, he said, Paul, an, an apostle by the will of God. And if you would take out the name Paul... And take out the word apostle. And insert your name. Then what would you put as far as, instead of apostle, what would you put in the second blank? What are you by the will of God? Do you know God's will for your life? Have you sought to know God's will for your life? Now, just as Paul said, I'm an apostle by the will of God, some of you could say, well, I am a contractor by the will of God. I am a doctor by the will of God. I am an attorney by the will of God. I am a housewife by the will of God. I am a mother by the will of God. And Whatever you are, it's important that you are what you are by the will of God. And that you know that I am what I am by God's will. This is what God has called me to be. And the Bible tells us that we should make our calling and election sure. And so Paul called to be an apostle by the will of God. And uh He he was confident that that was what God had called him to be. And we need to be confident. Uh, Quilla and Priscilla are special kind of people. And they're the kind of people I really enjoy. People whose lives are devoted to serving the Lord though they make a living making tents. But their real life is Christ, serving him. Years ago when I was employed by the Alpha Beta Markets, traveling around to the various markets, as I would meet people, uh, and, and they would say, well, uh, you know, because I would, I would fill in for managers when they would go on vacations and, or when they were sick. And so they would ask me about marketing career and all, and I said, oh, no, no. Um, this is just the way I make a living. I'm actually a minister of Jesus Christ. I'm a servant of Jesus Christ. But 
This pays the bills. This is the way I make a living. And, and I think that we need to look at whatever I am doing. It's only a way to support me so I can serve the Lord. We're all called to serve him in some capacity or another. Important that we know and that we are serving the Lord, that that's the primary thing. When I get to heaven, really, I hope to meet up with uh, Aquila and Priscilla. I think they're just fascinating people. Years ago, when I was uh, pastoring out in the uh, Pomona Valley area, uh, I had a Saturday night Bible study in a home in Claremont, very lovely home, and uh, the couple that were there, they're, they're, they reminded me a lot of Priscilla and Aquila uh, in that they uh, just were so turned on for the Lord. And uh, there would be a hundred people or so gather every Saturday night in their home there in Claremont. And uh, it was just, they were exciting people because of their great devotion for the Lord. Now, he was a businessman, very successful, and they had a very large home in Claremont that would accommodate 100 people there in their living room. And so uh, it was uh, one of, they're, they're sort of like Priscilla and Aquila in that their home was always open for people to come that they might share with them uh, the gospel of Jesus Christ. And there are many people like Priscilla and Aquila today. Uh, you won't read about them in Christianity Today or in the Moody Magazine or in Decision, but they're there. And uh, there, there are people who are just devoted uh, to sharing the Lord and uh, open home uh, that uh, they might use it in the sharing of the gospel. Now, Paul would often ply his trade as a tent maker so that he could freely give the gospel to others. Writing to the Thessalonians in his first letter, he said, For you remember, brethren, our labor and travail, for laboring night and day, because we would not be chargeable unto any of you, we preached unto you the gospel of God. I work night and day, laboring, so that I would not be chargeable to any of you. But I was doing that to support my ministry. For 17 years, I worked while a minister in order to support the needs of the family while I was ministering. Uh, I, I have a little problem with Fellows that when they start a church, uh, as soon as they get 50 people, they want to hire an assistant. Uh, well, I could. In his second letter to the Thessalonians, <laughs> Paul said, Neither did we eat any man's bread for nothing, but we wrought with labor and travail night and day, that we might not be chargeable to any of you. His desire to just share the word of God and, and not to charge people, not to make them feel obligated. In writing to the Corinthians, he said, Have I committed an offense in abasing myself? that you might be exalted because I preached to you the gospel of God freely. I robbed other churches, taking wages from them to do you service. Now, when Paul was there at Corinth, when Timothy and Silas did catch up with Paul, they brought to Paul a financial gift from the church in Philippi. Because the Philippians so loved Paul that they took up an offering, sent it by Silas and Timothy to Paul. And as Paul wrote to the Philippians in thanking them for that gift, 
He said, not because of the necessity uh, that I'm thankful, but I desire that fruit might abound to your account. And so Paul saw that the funds that they sent to him, uh, actually the fruit that came from his ministry went to their account because of their supporting him there in the ministry. So uh, when he said, I robbed other churches, he's not, you know, really saying he robbed them, but uh, they supported him as sort of a missionary so that he would not be chargeable to the Corinthians. And he said, and when I was present with you and I was in need, I was chargeable to no man for that which was lacking to me, the brethren which came from Macedonia supplied. And in all things I've kept myself from being burdensome unto you, and so I will keep myself. Uh, Jesus said, freely you have received, freely give. In the 20th chapter of Acts, when Paul was... Uh, talking to the elders of Ephesus as he was on his way to Jerusalem and met them there at uh, Melita. He said, Yea, ye yourselves know that these hands, and he probably showed them his calloused hands, these hands have ministered unto my necessities and to those that were with me. I have showed you all things how that so laboring you ought to support the weak. And to remember the words of the Lord Jesus, how he said it is more blessed to give than to receive. Uh, when Paul was ministering in Ephesus, it, it said that they would take handkerchiefs from Paul's body and lay them on the sick. The word handkerchief is sweatbands. When he was working, he would wear a sweatband to keep the perspiration from coming down in his face. And so when he would get off work and lay down his sweatband, someone would rip it off and put it on sick people someplace. And, and when it was put on them, they were healed. And so uh, he reasoned, we read here in the synagogue every Sabbath, and persuaded the Jews and the Greeks. Now, so each Sabbath day, because he was a rabbi, he would go to the synagogue, and uh, when opportunity was given, Paul would reason with them and persuaded the Jews and the Greeks. He was persuading them from the scriptures that the Messiah would be despised and rejected, that the Messiah would die. And he would point out the scriptures of the suffering of the Messiah. He did not yet share with them that Jesus was the Messiah. He was just laying the groundwork for that. He was showing them in the scriptures and persuading them in the scriptures uh, that their concept of just a reigning Messiah was not totally right. That the Prophecies of the Messiah also spoke of his being despised and rejected, a man of sorrow, acquainted with grief. And, uh, and he would be smitten and things of this nature. And so he was showing them and persuading them that there was another aspect to the Messiah other than just the glorious reign of the Messiah on the throne of David in righteousness and in peace forever. This seemed to be Paul's modus operandi. First to show them in their scriptures that their concept of the reigning Messiah was only partially correct. That there were other passages that dealt with the suffering and the death. And it was important that they saw this first in their scriptures. And once they could be convinced in the scriptures that the Messiah would indeed 
be rejected and suffer. Then Paul would take the second step. So now when Timothy and Silas did arrive from Macedonia, Paul, it says, was pressed in the spirit to declare to them that Jesus was the Messiah. He took the second step, uh, waiting perhaps for <laughs> Timothy and Silas that he might have a little backup and support because wherever he would declare this, many of the Jews would rise up and beat him and you know, throw him in prison and all this. And so it, maybe he was waiting for the support of, of Silas and Timothy before he uh, went to the second step and showing that Jesus was the Messiah. It's interesting to me the deep prejudice against Jesus Christ that many people have. And when Paul declared, and now they were listening, and he was persuading them, and they were, they were beginning to see that, yeah, my, yes, the Messiah has to suffer, though. You know, didn't realize that. And when they, then when he tells them Jesus is the Messiah, it erupts. Uh, it, it tells us that uh, they... Uh, And when they opposed themselves and blasphemed, in other words, it really just, they started blaspheming now when, when Paul tells them that Jesus is the Messiah. I don't know how you can explain the irrational reaction that many people have to Jesus Christ apart from the fact that Satan has them so bound and so blinded that their minds are prejudiced beyond rationality because they can talk to you in a very sane, calm, wonderful, gentle, polite way on any other subject that you might wish to discuss. If you want to talk about Buddha or Krishna or, you know, Muhammad, you know, they'll, they'll engage in conversation with you. But bring up Jesus Christ and there are some people that there's just uh, a, a internal kind of a revulsion to Jesus Christ that can only be explained by that they, Satan has such a powerful hold on their lives. Uh, because it is totally irrational. I do not know at what teaching of Jesus a person could be so totally upset over. Jesus taught that we were to love one another as we loved ourselves. He taught us that we were to be merciful towards those that offended us or were opposed to us. He taught us that we were to pray for our enemies and to do good to those who would spitefully use us. He taught us to forgive people their transgressions against us. He taught us to Help those that were in need. Now, what possible thing is Jesus teaching that can cause people to have such a horrible response against him? What are these things that Jesus has said that has upset them so much that they just become irrational? Jesus did say that the reason men would not come to him was that they loved darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil. 
I guess the fact that Jesus said, love your enemies, and the fact that he said, uh, be merciful and be forgiving and be kind, that probably didn't bother them so much as when he said, now live a pure life. Live a holy life. Do that which is good. That's probably the thing that irritates people. That's what Jesus said. They love the darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil. And, and if you say, well, yes, I believe that Jesus was the Son of God and what he said is true, then, you know, you've got to take all of what Jesus said. And he did say very kind and generous and wonderful things. But he did also say, that unless your righteousness exceeded that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you weren't going to enter the kingdom of heaven. That it isn't what comes out of your mouth that defiles you, it's what's, or it isn't what goes into your mouth, it's what comes out of your mouth that defiles you, because out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. And, and these are the kinds of things that, that, I guess, cause people to be irritated with Jesus. But these are the things that cause me to love him. And I think, though, that Jesus nailed it when he said, they love darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil. And that's the real reason why people won't come. They can offer flimsy excuses. But the real reason, they love darkness rather than light. And so with the Jews, the moment Paul said that Jesus is the Messiah, the irrational result, they opposed themselves and blasphemed. And so Paul just shook his garment and he said, your blood is upon your own head. I'm going to the Gentiles. In another place, he said, seeing that you count yourself unworthy of eternal life, I'll go to the Gentiles. But Paul's heart was always for the Jew. To the Romans, he said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It's the power of God to salvation to those that believe. To the Jew first and also to the Greek. And Paul said, my heart's desire and prayer for Israel is that they might be saved. And he said, I could wish myself a curse from God for my brethren's sake according to the flesh. Had a great heart, a great love for the Jews. Wanted to see their conversions. But they were the ones that were persecuting him. And so ultimately he would leave his, well, shake his garment. Jesus said, you know, when you go into a city, if they... Uh, receive you then remain there and and minister to them but if they don't receive you just when you leave the city shake the dust off your sandals it'll be more tolerable for Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment for that than for that city well Paul shook his garment and it was a it was a gesture of just all right you know shaking the dust off so to speak and I'm going to the Gentiles the Lord said to Ezekiel, chapter 3, verse 17, Son of man, I have made thee a watchman unto the house of Israel. Therefore hear the word at my mouth, and give them warning from me. When I say to the wicked, you will surely die, and you don't give him warning, nor speak to warn him of his wicked way, in order that you might save his life, that same wicked man will die in his iniquity, but his blood will I require at your hand. But if you warn the wicked, and he turns not from his wickedness, nor from the wicked way, he'll die in his iniquity, but you have delivered your soul. Again, when a righteous man turns from his righteousness and commits iniquity. 
and I lay a stumbling block before him, he shall die. But because thou hast not given him warning, he shall die in his sin, and his righteousness, which he has done, will not be remembered, but his blood I will require at your hand. Nevertheless, if you warn the righteous man that the righteous sin not, and he doth not sin, he shall surely live, because he is warned, and you have delivered thy soul. Now, Paul felt this same kind of a obligation that was on him, an obligation to warn and to speak God's truth. I think that each one of us have that kind of an obligation. We're not really obligated to win people to Jesus Christ. But we're obligated to witness to people of Jesus Christ. And if I have witnessed to someone, then I have delivered my soul. But if I fail to witness and they go on and die in their sin, then somehow I feel that I'll be held accountable somewhere for my failure. And, and here's Paul. He is, he's talking about, look, I'm delivering my soul. And I'm going to go to the Gentiles. I've delivered my soul. When Paul again met with the Ephesian elders that we referred to earlier. He said to them, Wherefore I take you to record this day that I am pure from the blood of all men, for I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God. And from now on, he said, I'll go to the Gentiles. So he, had, he declared to them the truth of Jesus Christ. Upset, blaspheming. <laughs> okay. Shake my garment. You, you've heard it. Now you're responsible. You see, until Paul told them, he felt the responsibility. Now that he's told them, the responsibility goes to them. And uh, so I think that that's something that's very serious and we should really think about. Have I left a real witness of Jesus Christ with those that I met and with those that I meet? Have I really delivered my soul from the possibility that they might die in their sin and the possibility had I shared Jesus Christ they might have been saved. Now what keeps us from sharing Jesus Christ? I think it's the fear of rejection. It's because people do often have such a violent re reaction against Jesus that uh, many times we are silent when we should have spoken up, but we just didn't want to face the violent reaction that people so often have when they've been witness to concerning the truth of Jesus Christ. And so, I need the power of the Holy Spirit to enable me to witness. Jesus said, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem, all Judea, Samaria, to the uttermost parts of the earth. Paul said, I am a debtor. He felt an obligation to share the gospel. And oh, that God would put that same kind of feeling upon each of us where we feel a duty, an obligation. I'm a debtor. I must share the gospel. Father, we thank you for the ministry and the life of Paul and 
Now we've been introduced to Priscilla and Aquila and just beautiful servants. Those that labored with Paul in the gospel. Those that just had that wonderful ministry within their home. Ministering to those that they would come in contact with. Lord, even as Paul said, and when Christ who is my life, we ask, Lord, that you would be our life, not a part of our life, but our life itself, that we would find our life in Christ and that we would, Lord, be effective witnesses for you wherever we are, in whatever environment we might be. Help us, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.